Hey, I wanted to take a word, a second to prepare, uh, to pray, excuse me. So let's pray together and then uh, we'll dive in. Father, thank you uh, for the, the word of God and the chance to think about our marriages and to grow together in them. I pray that you would help us by your spirit to do that, that we would communicate in a way that honors you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. So I don't know how, you know, your, your uh, exercises went. I hope that the, the chance to talk together was helpful for you. I hope, you know, if you want to share on Facebook on that group, then, then share away. Since I'm going to keep these things to 30 minutes so that they're manageable, I'm just going to assume that everybody was super deeply encouraged by uh, the last exercises. If you haven't been able to go and do those, let me just encourage you to make sure you do them because I think they really will provide good food for thought and chances to talk. Um, other than that, today I'll have exercises again, and uh, they're going to be, I think, good for you to, to work on your communication. But I want you to prepare yourself because if you thought the last ones were sticky, this, uh, there, there's an opportunity for, for good, healthy conflict and communication in these exercises. So today we're probably going to talk about one of the most important kind of big bucket items, and, and that is uh, the, the, the way we talk about everything else. Our communication is at the center of our marriage because last week we talked about the fact that we've made a covenant for the two to become one flesh, right? For the, the, the two individuals from two different families to make this bond together where they're now building a new home, building a new life. And that means that interpersonally, there's going to be differences of perspective, differences in values, differences in, in what they want to do and choose. But it also means that they're going to bring in different backgrounds from their family. And so before we talked about anything like money or children or career or sex or any of those things, you would have to look and say, do we know how to talk? about it from a biblical way? Do we know how to navigate all these topics as two people? And so the real goal for me is over the next 30 minutes to just lay some pieces out in front of us about biblical communication. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. All right, the PDF I've given you. Come on in, Sprinkles. I haven't even really started. I just, we're, we just got going. I'm sorry that I, I was using the Facebook group and I forgot that most of you, they might not have Facebook, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry. My, uh, the one who keeps my head on straight, she's got my back. So um, we're going to read Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 33 through 37. In the context here of Matthew chapter 12, there's some conflict going on, and it's because the, uh, the, the, the false leaders of Israel are, are calling Jesus a false uh, prophet and false um, miracle worker, essentially, and they're saying that he casts out demons by demonic power. And Jesus rebukes them, but then in the context, he says something deeply uh, impactful for our own communication. So as usual, I'm going to toss it to Abby to read verses 33 through 37. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Okay, so this passage actually is a really heavy passage that deserves a lot of meditation for, for a follower of Christ because we hear the Lord say some, some important things under the big idea or heading that I would say that our words carry us, they communicate serious truths. And, and that's the serious truths they communicate are about us. They reveal us. They help us see us ourselves clearly. And that, that I want you to think about it this way. There's an unbreakable connection between the heart and the mouth. And what Jesus says here, if you look, it's a, he says, how do you recognize a tree, right? By its fruit, all right? And in this, in this metaphor here, there are times when somebody would say, well, a tree that bears fruit, they would think of as the deeds. But I think in this context, it is 
Jesus talking about act specifically their words and that their words are actually revealing the person, right? They're the picture. If the tree is the human, the fruit is the words. And, and the connection that you need to embrace is that the, what Jesus says when he says the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And, and I want us to, to embrace that because in our culture, in our marriage, okay, this is like the dominant relationship in your life. And so there's a lot of times where you're going to see coming out of your mouth all the things that are in your heart. And here's what happens in our culture. Uh, a distancing or a downplaying of what we've said. That isn't what I meant. I shouldn't have said that. And we try to, frankly, like neuter the communication of our mouths. But here's the, here's the thing. Even if you speak a lie, there is something very accurate communicated in your speech. It's just communicated about you. What you said might be false, but a clear picture of you and your heart is being communicated. And that is really squirm worthy, right? If you think about it in your marriage, it'll make you just shift in your seat to think that every time you speak, an accurate picture of yourself is being communicated. And, and, I, and I think we have to wrestle with that because so often in our culture, we want to blame circumstances. We want to tell people other things. And, and James chapter three is a passage where I think the brother of the Lord riffs on the same principles. And he says, can salt water and fresh water come out of the same spring? No, he knows that, that that's not supposed to be the way it is because actually you, what's washing out over the lips is coming from the reservoir of, heart, of the heart. We talked about this, I think, a little last week, or maybe just when I was teaching somebody else, but Abby's cup right now, if I bump her, is going to spill, what do you have? A caramel macchiato, right? If, if you bump my cup, it's going to be black coffee, because that's the way you're supposed to drink coffee, right? But also because that's what's inside the cup. And, and a lot of times in our culture, here's what people want to do. Oh, the reason that caramel macchiato came out of my cup was because you bumped me. But do you know that if you bump an empty cup, right, what happens? Nothing comes out. If you bump a cup full of water, water comes out. Jesus was shaken, rattled, and squeezed, even crushed. And did sin ever come out of his mouth or out of his heart? No. Because there was no sin in him, right? And in your marriage... What you want to do is get away from what Jesus is saying, that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of, because it's uncomfortable to be revealed that way, right? But what we need to get back to is embracing what Jesus has said. Nope, what comes out of the lips came right out of the heart. And, and the second thing that I think I want to press this home even more is look at the last verse. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And, and is this the difference, you know, Jesus isn't saying we have speech righteousness instead of works righteousness and preaching a gospel of if you say the right things. What he is, I think, giving us a powerful illustration of is this. Your words and your heart are not separate at all. In fact, they're so close that if God measures you by your words, he will have accurately measured your heart at the final day. That's a, that's a super powerful thought. But, but Jesus says... Your words come straight out of your heart, so God could measure you directly by the fruit of your heart. In fact, he will see the fruit of your heart in your words. And that should cause, the, the I, I put kind of four bullet points in your notes, this should cause the believer to go that we never downplay our words in, in, in order to say that isn't what I, it, it didn't matter what I said. And we never distance ourselves from our words by saying that wasn't really me. I don't know what I was thinking. Every time you speak, you might have spoken inaccurately, but, but embrace this. An accurate picture of yourself was being communicated, right? And then the fact that our words reveal our hearts and our words reveal our need. And this is where we're going to go into James 4. So if you could turn to James 4, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn there because what we realize is Jesus is saying, hey, words are not just words. They are actively communicating hearts. And conflict in our lives is not conflict 
of speech. It's not just sticks and stones of the tongue. It is a conflict of two sets of, of persons who think differently, desire differently, and then speak as an action differently. Our hearts are in conflict, not just our tongues. We don't just fight when we communicate with our tongues. We are as whole persons. Remember, there's no separation between our tongue and our, and our heart. So James 4 is going to talk, touch on this. For It's crucial for us to understand conflict. Um, babe, can you read? Let's just go all the way to verse 12, 4, 1 through 12. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? All right, we're gonna, I'm going to pull cherry pick a few things from this passage, but they're really, really important. And the first one, is, I'll ask the question, where do fights and quarrels come from? Where, do they, where does conflict come from? It comes from unfulfilled desires in the heart. Conflict originates in the heart, whether the need is real or simply perceived. And I would say it's always perceived if, if someone is a believer. There's always a perception of need, not necessarily a reality of need because of the promises that God gives us. But, but it's, it's at the heart level, the conflict is animated. I use this little character today, okay? There's a husband and a wife, and they are fighting each other. And look what verse 1 says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Your desire, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Well, what's the thing? The husband thinks that he needs the treasure that the wife is keeping him from. Now, you label the treasure, okay? So some of the husbands on this screen might, some of the husbands on this screen might be labeling this as um, respect. And some of the wives on this screen might be labeling this as care or being cherished. Or maybe it's freedom for one of them. Whatever the treasure is, uh, that this person is looking at the other person as standing between them and their desire or their, their need that they think they have, right? And, and that's where the conflict comes. You think you need to go through somebody, so you kill them to get it. Even if you don't kill them with your fists, you just kill them with your words, right? You slander them. Even if you try to show if your heart had the freedom what comes out of your tongue is this hate and animus for the other person, to cut them down, to get them out of the way, to get what you want. Conflict comes from unfulfilled desires. So now let me ask you this question. Why does God call them adulterous? Why does James call them adulterous people? And the answer is because ultimately they're looking for their desires to be fulfilled by someone other than God, someone or something other than God. Conflict, sinful conflict, quarrels and fighting. I'll say it this way. Jesus had conflict. In fact, if you, if you follow like the Holy Week calendar at all, you'll know that today is the day that you people remember and celebrate Jesus purging the temple, flipping the tables, right? There was conflict. But it wasn't conflict that was, was bent on selfish, self-interested motives. It was for the glory of God and frankly, for the good and warning of the, the money changers, right? But, but sinful conflict comes from, from going to get 
something from someone other than God or get it our own ways. We, I, I like to think about it this way, okay? When we fear instead of have faith, when, when we think that God is not going to provide for us or that we have to provide for ourselves, then that's when we make fists, okay? And we, we either fight in order to get what we want or we grab handfuls and feast and try to gorge ourselves. And there's all kinds of indulgence and conflict that come from fundamentally lack of confidence, lack of faith, fear in God. I don't think God will provide for me whatever it is I'm desiring. And so I have to get it for myself. And now my spouse is standing between me and that thing, right? So um, that's why James says you're being adulterous. You're essentially, you're, you're, you're trying to go out and get your stuff your way on your own. And, and um, I think of it like, so for instance, for me, a big conflict we would have is, uh, is I would be really angry when Abby would decide to just turn her back and walk away from a fight. Because that was like totally different than the way I was raised. We were bulldogs and it was toe to toe till somebody couldn't breathe. And that was in some ways a, a respectful thing, we thought. <laughs> um, like that was part of, it was the highest. I would have much rather had somebody punch me in the mouth than just turn around, walk away and ignore me like that, right? And here's what I began to realize. The thing that was energizing the conflict in my heart was not usually the specific issue. We could fight about anything early in our marriage, right? But, but it was actually this desire I had for respect that I didn't realize, but I was trying to go get myself. Instead of, in, which we're going to talk about in the gospel of Christ, actually trusting Christ to do for me what needed to be done and to provide for me far more than I ever deserved. But that need underneath was what I had to stop. And in your exercise, when you guys talk, you're going to think through that, okay? What is animating my conflict? What is actually causing my heart to go to war? What do I think I need that I have to get myself that God won't provide? That energizes so much of our conflict. And James gives the simple attitudes that I've just listed here of the reason I put humility is because I think that if there's a, there's temptation for, for us not to listen to what our words are telling us about our unbelief and about our hearts. So we humble ourselves before the Lord, turn away from what our words are actually showing about the state of our hearts and turn back to dependence on God alone to satisfy us. Right. And here's a, a bullet point number three, which I could preach on this one for hours and hours, but I, I want to just lay it out there in bullet points for you to help you see the connection between James 4 and the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many times people think about Jesus' life, perfect life, the way we couldn't live, his sacrificial death in our place, and his victorious resurrection as our hope as kind of this box that is the starter kit of the Christian life, but it's actually the center of the burning center of the Christian life for the entire Christian life and for eternity. And, and what I want you to see is uh, that the work of Jesus Christ is the true solution to relational conflict. Your marriage is when there's conflict at the root, there is some level of unbelief in the work of Christ and the provision of Christ. And so here's the bullet points I've listed. Jesus forgives, so your sinful speech and sinful heart can be put to death, right? He's done that work on the cross. But Jesus also protects, so your fears can be conquered by his death and his judgment. So I want you to think about the wife in, in these matters. Uh, some of you might think I have an oppressive donkey of a husband and I need justice, right? I need somebody to make this right. And I want you to think about the work of Christ and what does he promise that, that, that ultimately not even death and anything below death will conquer those who have put their confidence in him, right? In the resurrection, you will be fully and finally protected from the presence of sin in this world and the th every threat of every kind. You will, you will be in a city that doesn't need any bars or gates, and 
God, part of the, the way that's accomplished is that God vindicates by holding accountable. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, I don't think many wives in, on this group are probably at the point where they're just waiting for the Lord to kind of smite their husband. But at any level, somebody who thinks I must, ultimately my protection and my life depends on me, has forgotten the work of Jesus Christ, that he protected us from the wrath of God and the penalty of death. And everything below that is ultimately under his power. And we have the ability, just like Jesus, to look at Pilate right before his death and say, you'd have no power unless it were given to you from above, because now we trust the Heavenly Father that Jesus trusted. But it also says Jesus satisfies. So instead of just fearing, your feasting and fighting can be unplugged by his return. Because Jesus gives us a clear picture to see the desires of this life as passing, fading, corruptible, and many times destructive. And he gives us the hope of eternal inheritance. And I'm talking to a group of what I, I believe are mostly believers. So I am I'm unmining, unpacking some things that, that deserve a lot of meditation. If you're unfamiliar with this, message me, and I'd like to talk to you more about this. But, but Jesus has got an inheritance for his people, kept in heaven for us. That should make the passing moments of this life. Think about the conflict we were having when I want respect, right? Think about the fact that, that I'm not going to get respect from one human, albeit the most important human on the planet to me, but one human in the scope of God's giant world when, because of the work of Jesus, the Heavenly Father has said, this is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased Which glory and rep respect and reputation should matter more to me? Probably, right, probably the creator of heaven and earth saying, I love you, should function in my life strongly enough that I don't feel a need to go get more glory for myself by fighting with my life or by bragging or boasting, right? Probably I should be satisfied by the, the things that Christ has accomplished for me and ultimately will make fully visible when he returns, enough to unplug the energy to go get it now. All right, and I'm flying over how we apply the gospel to our lives, but look at the fourth one. Jesus empowers your speech and your heart. They can be propelled by the Spirit of Christ so that you can walk differently. And that's where we're going to look at Ephesians 4. It says, believers communicate lovingly from a heart of love. Maybe can you read Ephesians 4, 29? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Okay, so, so here's the dynamic of a satisfied believer. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, walk in love as dearly loved children, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Sacrificial commitment to the good of another is love and love is holiness. We put God highest and others first. And here Paul says, what kind of speech couldn't come out of your mouth? The kind that destroys, that decays, that, that corrupts other people, the kind that has no benefit for the other person because we, being fully satisfied in God as beloved children, Ephesians 5, 2, now pour ourselves out for others. So there's nothing I'm trying to get, whether it's to cut down my enemy or to build up myself. So what am I speaking for in a way that destroys another person? I'm fully satisfied in God. But then it also says, not only do we not speak that way, but we speak in a way that builds up. And we do this in a way that actually is thoughtful and careful of the occasion. So I've taken Ephesians 4.15 as kind of a rule of thumb where we flip it on its head. So speak the truth in love. And I think a good way for you to think about it is love, truth, speak. So I take the other person's best interest. That's love. Greater love has no one than this. They lay down their life for their friend. So am I looking for the best interests of the other? Am I speaking by or in line with the truth of God's word, putting God's word highest, and then I communicate? I, I take this opportunity and I, that's gonna keep me from just being doing the truth bomb, right? That's gonna keep me from just throwing out these fireballs of, of, of God's word intended to blow up. All right? And some of you know God's word enough or know people who know God's word enough that they can use God's word as a high fastball that's sent right for their chin of their, their spouse, right? 
And, and that's not what Paul talks about. He talks about putting God highest and the best interests of others first. So we are a craftsman with our words, thinking what would be fitting to make this better and beautiful. All right. That's how our speech comes. Now, I'm going to talk about some practical guidelines and I got to get it. We, we're actually doing okay. Uh, uh, some chance to talk about, I want to have Abby share a couple stories. But one of the things that I wanted you to do first, practical guideline, is understand your style. And I've put on the handout two polar opposites, pretend peace and catastrophic conflict, all right? And what I'm saying by those is you have a sinful predisposition, a, a mode that you drop into where you're going to unload. What would you be yours, honey? I'll pretend peace for sure. Pretend peace. What would be mine? Pretend peace, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, mine would be catastrophic conflict. Mine and hers would be, so you have, you have the, the, the soft, you know, on the surface, but lots of pressure building up. And then you have old faithful that's just letting the guys, or here's the thing though, both of these, if somebody's pressed enough, pretend peace doesn't actually create real peace. It's just the illusion of peace until the pressure is intense or the endurance goes long enough that somebody blows up. Catastrophic, it's, it really could be labeled catastrophic peace as well because there is no opportunity for the, the real conflict that needs to happen in this world or the, the, the unhealthy conflict that's happening underneath the surface to be dealt with. So I would ask you to look and say, which one of these am I? Am I a fighter or a flighter? Am I a down player or am I an exaggerator? Am I going at the throat or am I going to another room, right? That's what you need to be. And, and you, if you don't know what you are, ask your spouse, okay? Because <laughs> they know what you are and, and they've lived it and they've borne the brunt of it. And then my tip for you would be this, go over the line. And, and that's just a goofy way of saying this, but the middle line for you, you're probably in your disposition going to err on the side of the way that you're wired. And so a, a person who's catastrophic conflict, I think needs to think, hey, I'm gonna miss towards the side of peace. I'm gonna be more patient about when I look for and speak in conflict than I want to be. And Abby, a pretend peace is going to say, maybe I need to look for a little conflict every now because in my own disposition, I'm going to probably avoid this at every cost. But sometimes there are things that are worth saying hard things about, right? And so for you, know, understand where you are and then anticipate the fact that you're going to have to go over the line a little bit. You're going to have to not, not say something inappropriate, but I mean, go, I'm saying it that way to say you're going to have to overcompensate for your disposition in order to have a healthy, constructive middle ground. Because guess what? Here's the thing. There must be conflict in this world, not always animated by sinful desires. There's going to be sin in your spouse and there's going to be sin in the world. And if anybody on this, uh, on this Zoom or watches this thinks, well, if I'm, if I'm sinless, there won't be conflict. Look at Jesus. There is injustice in the world. There are peep sinners around you. Now, we need to be worried about the sin in us first because we're not sinless like him. But we need to recognize that conflict will still exist. And so if you're a pretend peacer, you need to try and say, well, maybe I need to be willing to endure in some saying some hard things. If you're a catastrophic conflict hound, then you need to think, maybe I need to give it a little more before I confront this thing, you know? And then um, I think the last thing, this pyramid, uh, is I, I want to really give you a, a framework for thinking about your communication. Do you see the pyramid? Because a lot of people, they here's what they do. When they have a problem, they blame it on the fact that we've just got to do better okay, we're going to do it differently next time, right? But actually, the practical guidance I have for you is that a pyramid falls from the foundation. The pyramid here I've given you has trust, clarity, commitment, and follow through. If you don't have a relationship of trust, then you will often see failure to, to work together in the follow through, and you'll think, oh, okay, we'll just do it better next time. But actually... A pyramid falls from the bottom. 
And you need to look and say, wait a second, something is going wrong at the foundational level. And here's what I mean, okay? Uh, if we don't have trust enough to be truly vulnerable, and that's why I think this starts with the leaders in the home, the men, if you don't have the trust built where, where, where you can truly humbly hear criticism or ask for help, then there's not going to be clarity when there's disagreement. If, if, if your wife doesn't feel safe enough with your temper, with your pride, with your ears to listen when she says you're not doing the right thing, you'll never hear it because she'll stop saying it or she'll find ways to say it without words that don't build you up, but just build frustration. And, and, and what happens is it's easy to be like, well, why didn't you tell me? And the reason why, I don't know, I didn't know how, the reason is actually because she didn't have the confidence in you, the trust in your relationship to take that step to offer something very heavy or weighty and, and ask you to actually respond well with it. And so, so guys or there's many times where this vulnerability just has to start with the husband being willing to be a repenter, the husband being willing to be a, a listener, the husband being willing to actually say, I need help or I need to think through this because many times it's uh, because of frankly, even just physical force, it's imposing to say hard things to someone who is by default has power, right? Physically you're bigger and stronger, but trust is crucial. You have to be able to, Look at each other, speak clearly with each other about your fears, about your frustrations, about your desires, enough that then people can respond. For instance, okay, um, I didn't even know I had a trust breakdown, but you want to tell them about that one with the, one of the examples? Um, the, the, the reading one? Oh, when we would go on vacation? Yeah. We would, oh, we would often go to Florida on vacation and he would be irritated about something and I didn't really know what he was irritated about. Um, and it came out that he was wanting to read his book and it seemed like everybody was getting in his way or he just wouldn't get his book out even um, because he felt like there wasn't time for it. Or actually, I think he thought I didn't want him to read his book basically. Um, and then when we talked about it, it was just a simple, hey, I'd like to read my book for a little while. Like, can we talk about this? But it was this big conflict in his heart and mm -hmm. causing a conflict between us because there was no discussion about it. It was just he thought I didn't want him to read his book and I was getting in his way or the kids were getting in his way. Yeah. And I didn't even know that that was a desire that he had. So, so think about the pyramid. I, I didn't have the humility to be vulnerable and say, I would like this thing. I would like help. Like I, I work. And then when we go on vacation, I do sometimes dream about some time to read a big thick book that I wouldn't get to read at home. And I didn't have the humility at that point to actually say, I would like this. I need your help to get this. And what I really did was just create frustration because I never gave that clarity and the opportunity for, for Abby to work together for us to take up what it would take because instead I'd say, oh no, she doesn't want to watch all the kids for me to read a little bit or whatever and just leave it underneath. I didn't take that vulnerable step of saying, I need your help. And on the upside, we just see these conflicts. But it was really the fact that I wasn't humble enough to build, uh, to speak clearly and say, this is what I have a desire for. But other places, I think we see, um, Okay, for instance, maybe, maybe some of you guys have work re responsibilities, right? And, or, or, or ladies, you have work responsibilities. And you know what you get is you get uh, one spouse dragging their feet or folding their arms like, hey, I got stuck with the bill while you were out having fun. Or, hey, I want to have, somebody wants to have a, a dude boys night or a girls night out. And, and you know what it happens is there's this, this kind of silent, fussing that happens in the marriage because nobody does something alone when you're one flesh, right? The two have become one flesh. In order for me to go out, we have four kids. In order for her to go out, we have four kids. Somebody's going to actually have to carry more weight 
And instead of talking clearly about it, because we actually trust each other enough to love each other and say, oh, I want something that is enjoyable for you. I want something that is encouraging for you. We keep it quiet. We do it anyway. We don't air it out. So the wife doesn't say, hey, this is causing a lot of extra pressure on me by you taking those extra hours without asking me at work. Or the husband doesn't say, hey, I really am feeling like I, I would just be really helped by some time in the woods to go hunting. Instead, what do you get? You get no agreement, no talk about it, no trust in the relationship. You just have the conflict at the top because, because nobody has ever committed to carry the weight, but they still have to carry it. When the husband goes out hunting, but nobody agreed on it, there's still four kids at home, right? When the wife decides, hey, I don't like this, but doesn't say it, there's still the friction. And what you need to be thinking about is saying, are we humble and vulnerable enough to then speak clearly about where we're upset or what we desire, what obstacles we see, what fears we have, and then to buy in. There is a, there is a I'm gonna try and speak in it very neutrally, I'll just tell a story, but one of the places I saw God's grace in our marriage was there was some, some requirements for a ministry that I'm a part of where we would have to follow through and it cost our whole family. I would be gone and Abby would be with all the kids while I was gone on this commitment. And there was other guys who were in ministry that would have to do this as well. And we often had this vivid illustration of a few years back in our marriage, because I would be with a husband who was constantly sulking about the fact that he was away from his family to do this ministry. He didn't do the ministry well, and his family was all ticked that he was gone. Instead of like what we had the joy of seeing in growth was we talked about how we could take up this ministry together. Sure, I went to do it. She helped me do that ministry by owning the extra weight of that time in our marriage or seminary or whatever, right? But when that never was stated and one person just got stuck with the toddlers and the other one got the exciting whatever, there was this resentment that can build and neither relationship actually grow. So I'm going to leave that now because we're going over our time. But I want to give you these assignments below that are really helpful um, I think they're each going to have something different for you, but I'm going to warn you. Okay. There's two of them. And then I, I actually skipped a piece that I'll, maybe I'll come back to in the future. But the first exercise is this. You find, you take 10 of these proverbs. Okay. Um, and then you're going to take them and you are going to take three that reflect your struggles in communication and three that reflect your strengths. So you pick 10. You look through those passages that talk about communication from God's word. And then all I want you to do is, is read them together, 10 of them at least, together. And then, you know, you can assign them to each other. You can say, well, that's your strength. That's your weakness, whatever. But if you don't want to fight, you can say, well, that's mine, right? And you can own it. But then the second exercise is this. Take uh, with your spouse and choose a problem that you, is unresolved or something that was recently re resolved. I want you to put this conflict that you recently had in the category of like, if it's a one through 10, pick a five through a seven. So something that matters, but not so much that you're going to get divorced because of this exercise. All right. So I would like you to take a conflict you've recently had or recently finished. Maybe when it's not finished or when it's finished, that's, that's mild heat. Okay. And then I want you to work through the questions below and ask yourself, what was I desiring? And think about the application of James and, and say, what was I desiring? What was I trying to get for myself? How was I going about this? And please finish all the way through the bottom question. Do you need to repent of anything? If you do, then, then, then follow through that line. Okay, that's what those exercises are about. Um, there's so much more. 30 minutes. I should have said 40 marriage minutes, but uh, this is where we're going to stop. Yeah, then we would have 50, right? Exactly. So we love you guys, and I'd love to chat on the Facebook page or privately, but I want to honor this time. I'm already a couple minutes over, so we're going to get off. Thank you.